Hi everyone, my name is Lucien. Most of you know me from Twitter as Triangle Investor, and today my guest is Thomas Plan. Thomas is the CEO of Myriad Uranium Exploration Company with assets in Niger. Thomas, welcome to my show. Hi, thank you, Lucho. It's good to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, I usually start with the same question for all my guests, and that is, who are you? Uh, what's your background, and how did you become a Myriad CEO? Sure. So, yeah, again, uh, I'm Thomas Lamb. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. I was a corporate lawyer uh, at the beginning of my career, and I worked in M&A and securities, and uh, we had lots of uh, resource clients. So I learned about mining and junior mining doing that. Um, a few years later, I left. Uh, I was going to move to uh, Europe, etc. I had a, was in love and all these things. And uh, but, uh, you know, that, that uh, life changed very quickly. And when I was about to sort of circle back so, to law, yeah. um, some opportunities came up in junior mining. I thought, you know, I'm going to try this. Um, and I became entrepreneurial with, uh, with some friends. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I can always go back to corporate law. Um, but I didn't. So I ended up starting a few juniors. Um, uh, one uh, was called Gold Group. Um, it was a gold uh, explorer and a small producer. And uh, we started that when gold was around $200, $290 an ounce. And we had a nice IPO at around $1,900 an ounce. It was a nice success. I thought, wow, this is, this is a great business. Um, Which course, year was that? Was, that was 2005 to 2010. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, and during that, I mean, uh, I got involved in, in various other uh, junior companies and invited to do interesting things. I started to learn about uh, junior mining from the management side. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a, had a, had a good run. Uh, so that's how I got into, I was, a, you know, the first shareholder of that company and, uh, and an early shareholder in various others. So there I was in junior mining, moved to London. Uh, mm -hmm. went to London Business School, uh, did a master's there. Mm -hmm. And there I met somebody who became CFO of a big Russian company, uh, one of the big second largest gold producer in uh, Russia. And uh, I ended up joining the board of that company um, uh, because I had the mix of skills. So I've worked you know, uh, for really big companies, uh, juniors. After that, I started a uh, project generator with uh, uh, Two partners, Dr. Jennifer Hinton and Andy Edelmeyer, who was a, a, a banker in London, J.P. Morgan and Credit Suisse, etc. Um, the three of us started a project generator. We created a company called M2 Cobalt. The three of us together, which we sold to Gervois Global, uh, kind of an offshoot of Glencore, in that the nickel nickel cobalt folks, uh, senior nickel cobalt folks mm -hmm. from Glencore, started this Gervois. Uh, global company um, based in Australia. We sold M2 Cobalt to them. I worked for uh, for Gervois. Mm -hmm. All of this was in East Africa, Project Generator and M2 Cobalt. And so there I was 10 years in Africa, uh, lots of experience uh, building companies, selling them, um, uh, running, you know, running them as, as management director, founder, uh, operations, etc. So, so I'm a bit of an Africa guy. Um, and how specifically I got into uh, Myriad and and yes. and uh, CEO, yes, yeah, is is that uh, my friend and uh, uh, longtime friend and colleague Pete Smith, uh, really smart guy. Um, he went to Cambridge University and he put Myriad together uh, several years ago, and ended up um, because uh, through a contact with Cambridge University uh, that uh, knew this group in Niger that had these assets, um, he ended up putting this deal together. Um, I came on as a consultant because I, I speak French. I uh, have lots of experience in Africa. Um, I was brought on as a consultant. And I think Pete the whole time, and we're, we're close friends and, and colleagues, I think he had in mind that I would eventually step in I, and become CEO. I, I did not think that at all. But uh, November, past November, uh, you know, I became CEO. Uh, that, that's uh, uh, to my surprise, uh, but I think he had that in mind all along. Um, so, uh, you know, I started to um, study the uranium thesis, uh, learn a lot about Niger. I got very excited about it. I was going to do something else. And then I realized, you know, this is extremely exciting. 
uh, I couldn't resist. And that's, uh, so I, I accepted, I became CEO in November. That's, that's a, that's my journey. Uh, so here I am as of, as of November 1st, CEO of Myriad. Great, Thomas. Yeah. That's a nice background. Uh, so you work around the globe when with that experience, what can you tell me, what are the advantages of doing business in Niger? and uh, compared to other countries, and of course, uh, dis disadvantages of doing business in Niger. Sure. You know, there are lots of balances uh, and, and pros and cons of uh, every jurisdiction. Um, you know, if you work in, a, in an advanced jurisdiction, Australia, Canada, et cetera, um, you know, costs are high, there's uh, lots of culture, you know, cities, towns, uh, farms, uh, forests, you're gonna have to, get uh, um, permits to cut down, uh, access, et cetera. There's, you know, so, so, you, so, so while on the one hand, certain things are easy, lots of skilled labor, uh, et cetera. On the other, there are lots of things that can slow you down too. Yeah. Um, there, so that's one point. Then there are jurisdictions that you, where maybe you don't have things that are gonna slow you down, but they don't have a, an experienced labor pool or a government and bureaucracy that is used to mining, that understands it, that gets it, uh, let alone a government that is excited about it and wants to, you know, is inviting foreign investors and wants to make life uh, good for them. Yeah. So Niger actually has a really neat balance uh, and, um, and lots of really positive characteristics. The French, I mean, there's, you know, there's colonial history in Niger and West Africa with the French, et cetera, but the, the French have been exploring for and, and mining uranium in Niger for decades. They have trained lots of people, uh, geologists, geoscientists, uh, yeah. you know, miners, etc. Also, the government there is used to mining, what it requires, how it works, what you need, roads, uh, infrastructure, um, you know, trained people, laws, taxes, etc., royalties. All of that is in place in Niger, unlike lots of other jurisdictions in Africa, which are, are resource rich, but yeah. where, where the that don't have really experience. smart, yeah, experience. Niger has is full of really smart people that are are well trained, you know, local Nigerians um, and drilling companies and support. So, plus the the bureaucracy is there in place. Um, smart people in government, smart people locally uh, trained to to mine. It's a really exciting uh, and you know great asset as a foreign investor. So that's that's one thing I wanted to point out. Uh, sometimes it's overlooked. Um, uh, you know, Niger has where the uranium is in the in the basin, in the Timur-Soy basin. People look at photos of it. You can mm -hmm. see that there's, you know, there's not a lot there for the most part. It's and it's mostly empty and desert. So you're not, you know, if you're mining there, you're not interfering with, um, you know, cities and towns and uh, other types, you know, rivers and forests. And yeah, yeah. I mean, there are exceptions, but it's, um, you know, areas. So that so that's great too. You can go in and, mm -hmm. and access is there. Um, You've got, uh, uh, you know, a good a good regime in terms of the, the structure, the laws, et cetera. There's new there's a new mining law that's uh, uh, that's being uh, adopted uh, now. It's just in the process of some things are being finalized, and, and that looks good. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing about Niger is it, it's uh, GoVX, who your your viewers are, are, are probably very familiar with GoVX already, Global Atomic, yeah, and uh, Arano. These are these are Canadian companies that have been there since. You know, I'm just approximating 2006, 2007, 2008. Yes. Uh, they've been there and they have been well supported by the government. And, you know, through ups and downs, um, uranium market, politics, et cetera, these companies have flourished. And we now see that. And, and you know, they've done well for many years. So this is, this is not a situation where, you know, for example, just to contrast Zambia, um, or you could pick lots of countries around the world where foreign investors have come in and they have a good few years. And then all of a sudden there's turbulence <laughs> politically or, you know, something, et cetera. And, and they, the, the companies lose support or have a difficult time in the country. And then, you know, they exit, they get replaced by others. In Niger, these, there's been continuity with these companies that have been well supported by the government. And these are Canadian companies. And, and now we see, you know, these companies are, are doing well. They've made their investors lots of money. Yeah. Um, I, I would also say that uh, Niger has been producing uranium uh, since, uh, well, for a long time, but delivering. 1970. Across, 
Yeah, exactly. And it's been delivering a constant supply of uranium to yeah. America's largest utility, Chicago-based, I think it's called Exelon. Uh, it's yes. about 2007, 2008. This is a constant, uninterrupted supply to America's largest utility. Since then, this is a this is a sort of secure supply. You know, this is something that investors should be aware of and take note of regarding this co- this country. It's stable. The, go- the government wants it to be, uh, you know, a proven jurisdiction. So that's exciting too, uh, as as a data point. You don't see that uh, everywhere. Uh, right. And America has its largest air force base in Africa, in the middle of the uranium basin. This, this is really good for security. Uh, it, it, I mean, this is well thought out. This is this is going to make the area very secure for a long time, right? The people are thought ahead. The Americans, Europeans, there's a French military base, other yes. you know yes. security infrastructure there. So this is a secure area uh, because the area, the region around it, there's instability in other surrounding countries. So we want to make sure Niger is stable. So that's that's uh, you know those are those are some positives. There's there's lots more. Uh, so far, an easy place to operate, uh, very welcoming government. Yeah. On the downside, is it, the difficulties. The fact is, it's it's in West Africa. It's not. This is not, um, you know, Canada, Australia, uh, etc., where uh, you know the sort of the, where the region is extremely stable, long history of stable government. You you can see in the region in West Africa that surrounding countries there's instability. Yeah. Um, you know the. The question is, will that spill over into Niger? People are trying to prevent, everybody wants to prevent that. Government, foreign investors, everybody. So, uh, but the region, it's it's uh, it's West Africa. Uh, there's that. Um, you know, there have been security incidents in, in years past, especially sort of 2008, 2009, and uh, 2013. You know, there are things. It's, it's, it's sub-Saharan Africa, um, and it's surrounded by countries where, you know, some people will, will want to get in across the border and, yes. uh, you know, cause disruption. Um, you know, it'll do some raids into neighboring, you know, the, the borders for the local people aren't necessarily all of this is where the border is. Yeah. Uh, for them, this is their home. You know, they cross the border. So so there's complexity around that. You have to be you have to be careful about uh, about security, although, you know, we view the security situation as being very good. Yeah. Um, so that's uh you know that's that's something. There's always, um, you, you know, you're, you're in Africa, so uh, you have to, you know, dealing with the government and laws, etc. Um, uh, you know, you have to be conscious of what's going on, and keep an eye on uh, how things are evolving and politics. But uh, you know, those are some 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 of the pros and some of the uh, you know the potential complexities and things to watch out for. Yeah. Well said, Thomas. Uh, you have four properties in Niger. Uh, can you tell me how did you acquire them and at uh, what terms? Yeah, so uh, again, uh, Pete, uh, my Peter Smith, my predecessor, yeah. he started negotiating uh, to acquire these properties or, or looking at them around two years ago. This is before uranium got, got hot. We would mm-hmm. never get these properties now. Um, yes, at this price. Yeah, you know, they are located, uh, just a little aside here, they're located our northernmost property, each each property is about, uh, of the, there are four, uh, yes. each is around 450 square kilometers, just a little bit over that. The big, these are big, big uh, project areas. Our northernmost project is just a few kilometers north of Arano's Imeraran deposit. This is Africa's largest uranium deposit. And the structure that hosts that goes north into our project area, just a few kilometers north. <clears throat> and then then it's our project area, and then we have, and it's all Goviex to our north. So we are, and we are on the structure that hosts, in fact, we're the structures that host Goviex's project, Madawella, Arano Zimmerarin, and then further north you have Somer and Komenak. These are, t- you know, two mines, yes. Arano uh, producing mines. One of them's producing that, the other one's been there, uh, shut down, uh, and the mill, uh, Arano's mill. So the, I mean, it, this. The, the, the location is extremely good. Um, I just want to put some aside. I'll get back to uh, how okay. we acquired them. So, so these licenses are were very exciting two years ago, but you know, uranium hadn't gotten hot. But you know, Peter had some ideas, and we were the thesis was that uranium was going to um, uh, hot up, get exciting. 
So he started negotiating uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, sealed the deal with the uh, vendors. This is a group called Loxcroft, mm -hmm. uh, effectively a West African Nigerian uh, 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 company, although it's based in uh, Seychelles, um, uh, that own these four properties. So the, the deal is, is that uh, uh, we can earn 100%. We, we have an option. The option is to earn 100% of these projects. Uh, properties over six years. Um, the terms are we get to 80% by spending $2 million on uh, exploration, a million and a half of that on drilling within within the first two years. And also, and we've already done this, uh, pay them 8.5 million shares of the company. They already have those shares. They're tied to us. That's about a one third of our outstanding shares. Mm -hmm. uh, just maybe just, just a little bit under that. Um, and so, you know, soon we'll be at 80% ownership. Then we have a number of years uh, to decide whether we want to get to 100%. Uh, and we do that with uh, a, effectively a $6 million uh, payment at the end. It's kind of a bullet payment at the end. But by that time, you know, uh, you know, hopefully a multi-hundred million dollar market cap. And that's just, uh, you know, a, a step uh, we'll take at that point. And so those are the terms, those are the option terms. Um, and we have to do some exploration, uh, uh, like I said, to spend $2 million on, uh, on exploration. And that is within about the next 15 months. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, we, to, we, to will, we will get to this uh, exploration a little bit later. Uh, yeah. By looking at the map, uh, one could say your property is uh, strategically positioned between yeah. Orano, Bovix, and uh, Global Atomic Properties. Uh, right. I would like if uh, we can go one by one of these properties, uh, details about sure. these properties. You have, uh, is it pronounced Aj Ajebo? Yeah, I would say Ajebut. Ajebut. Sorry, but, my uh, you know, if you're, Well, yeah, and, and, you know, others say Agabut, uh, too, depending on, you know, whether yeah. you're... Okay, so Agebut. I will say Agebut. It's much easier. That's fine. Uh, Agebut, Afudei, uh, Tagait uh, 2 and yeah. Tagait 3, right? Exactly. Okay, yeah. let's touch on Agibut. Uh, Agibut. Uh, sure. th this project borders Orano and Moraren and Govix Maduela project. Uh, my question is to you: How is the infrastructure infrastructure there? Uh, what was previously done uh, uh, in the terms of exploration on this property, and what is the exploration? What is your exploration plan for the next twelve months and uh, the budget on it? Yeah, uh, fine. So infrastructure, there's there's uh, road access. Um, you know, the, the roads are uh, desert roads, yes. uh, largely. You know, I, I, I'm not sure the extent of paved roads, sealed roads, but the, de you know, the, the desert roads are are reasonably good. Yes. Um, this, the southern part of our license is right near Imareran's, Arano's uh, airstrip. So, mm -hmm. and they've, they've uh, told us in the past that we could access that airstrip. So as needed, we can. That's good um, to know. Yeah. Um, you know, Imararan, uh, you know, eight kilometers to the south is, uh, there's lots of infrastructure around there because uh, Arano has invested uh, lots of money uh, in that, obviously over the, over the decades. Um, the, the whole basin is not too, everywhere in the basin is not too far from, uh, uh, you know, power, uh, roads, et cetera. Um, uh, and especially because we are between Arano's Imararan and its Somer and Komanak mines. You know, our yeah. property lies between them on the structure. Um, our property was previously owned by Arano, Arriva. Yes. And uh, so if you're viewers who don't know, um, you know, how it's a continuation of the question of how we got the licenses. Yeah. So, so our, all of our licenses were previously owned by Arriva Arano. After Fukushima, uh, uranium price went down to $19. Uh, Arriva went bankrupt, had to be restructured. And uh, the decision was made out of Paris to drop exploration licenses in Niger and I assume elsewhere. Also, yes. the, you know, politically, there was pressure to do that because the Niger wanted to open the country up to foreign investment and others, especially Canadians and Australians who explore. So that is, that's sort of how we got the licenses. Uh, Ariba had to relinquish these licenses and our partners jumped on them and grabbed them. 
so it's, you know, fortunate uh, events. Okay. Yeah. okay, so historically, Arriva did a fair amount of regional scale exploration on our license, uh, the Ajaboot license or Agaboot license, uh, radiometrics, surface geochemistry, mapping, uh, a fair amount of drilling, only down to 300 meters. This is where the roughly the carboniferous layer of the sandstone layer ends and the carboniferous, la carboniferous layer begins. Yeah. And this is because Imararan uh, is in the shallower sandstone. It's a roll front sandstone uh, um, uh, deposit style. So they wanted to keep finding more of those. So, you know, there were a few dozen holes drilled historically at wide spaces. These were done, if, you, if your viewers can look at the map or the PowerPoint, you'll see they were done mostly to the east, eastern part of the license. So just north of Imararan, the Arlet Fault, which hosts Imararan, continues into our license where it merges with the Matawella Fault. The Matawella Fault to the northeast hosts Goviex's Matawella deposit. Where those two faults merge within our license, we call Imararan North. So Imararan itself is you know, world's second largest uranium deposit, et cetera. Just to the north where those faults merge, Imararan North, as we call it, is a prime targeting area. This, this area, uh, Arriva had plan big plans for that area. Our understanding is they just never quite got to the doing it. This is about 65 and 65 drill holes tar you know, planned for that intersection. They never quite got to it. Uranium hit $19, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Arriva had to restructure. And so they rel relinquished the area. But we have, so we have their historic data, I mentioned radiometrics, mapping, uh, drill, some drilling, uh, and we have their plans to do these 65 drill holes for that, that area. I want to add that Global Atomic discovered DASA, you know, depending on when you put the discovery holes, et cetera, but you know, call it 2007 to 2013, and then lots of really exciting drilling since, et cetera. They went deeper. And so after the initial Arriva plans were made for our intersection there in Marrera North, internally they were talking about, well, now we know that we should look deeper because it may be that there's high grade uranium uh, deeper in that area, just like uh, a, a Global Atomic found at its DASA deposit. So we have historic data and then we have these insights from the Global Atomic. Uh, discovery of DASA plus what we're what we're doing right now uh, which is geophysics that is that's starting almost today we're doing 50 meter spaced drone mag geophysics this is a program just covering that intersection of those two faults the Matawella and Arlo faults that's happening right now they're also looking at uh, and we will we'll probably very soon initiate an AMT uh, elect a, that's an electrical method uh, geophysics, uh, surface geophysics that it penetrates down to up to a kilometer down. And that's so the drone mag will help us map the surface and the AMT will help us map the subsurface. We're going to integrate all the historic data that we have, plus the insights from Global Atomics DASA, plus the geophysics data that we're, we're generating now. And that is going to give us drill targets that we're, we're basically going to evolve or update uh, global, uh, sorry, uh, Arano's, now Arano, but Ariba's uh, drill plan. And then we're going to have hopefully very exciting drill targets for this intersection area. And then later this year, our plan is to drill those. So that is, uh, that's what's going on. I can give you some budget numbers too, if you like. Yeah. Uh, yes, please, but some budget numbers and uh, potentially how many meters of drilling do you expect uh, to do there? Um, sure. So the budget numbers, the, the drone mag costs, uh, you know, the hard, the hard cost of the drone mag itself in, in this area, plus another area that I'll speak about, which we're also, where we're also flying in, is around $200,000 US. Okay. But that does not include support, top, uh, support costs. This is security, uh, uh, logistics, the, uh, uh, accommodation, et cetera. Yes, I understand. Um, uh, so, you know, and all of that is probably another $150,000. Um, uh, so that is for the drone mag. The uh, AMT is 
around 80,000 US for these are these are fairly small areas. The AMT, uh, AMT actually, we may not necessarily do the AMT at this intersection. This round, we may do the AMT only closer to Global Atomics DASA for reasons that I can get into um, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in due course here. Um, so those are some of the costs. There'll be an additional logistics and security costs related to the AMT next month. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, and so, uh, and sorry, you had a second part to the question? I was just telling you the uh, costs. Then. The second part was how how deep do you plan to go? Uh, right. Yeah, and how many meters? And how so many so. meters, yes. Yeah, um, so we don't know yet. Um, we can accomplish a lot of, you know, drilling is not particularly expensive. Uh, there, it's not like we have to helicopter it in and do expensive drilling. And it doesn't necessarily all have to be diamond uh, drilling. Um, uh, although we will want to uh, check out the orientation of the vaults, et cetera, using uh, diamond. Uh, so let's see. Um, some of our holes will go deeper, maybe to 500 meters, and maybe a number of them, depending on how we interpret the geophysics. Um, but the answer is, um, you know, uh, we could probably accomplish a lot for a million dollars. Yeah. Um, uh, and get a lot of good information, perhaps make some exciting, uh, you know, do some exciting drilling for that. Um, depending on them, we're a small company. You know, our market cap's around uh, $8 million Canadian. Um, so, uh, you know, how much money are we going to raise for drilling? That is a question, right? Uh, and at this stage. So yeah. uh, we're going to try to optimize without being, you know, too careful. We want to be able to, uh, you know, execute a good drill program. We could, we have, we also have an alternative plan that uh, takes us up to four and a half million dollars worth of drilling um which would be exciting but they, you know we have to do things step by step so yeah that's a reasonable answer uh do we have a uh, contracted companies that are doing that drilling uh well we haven't we have... oh pardon me there no problem so, so do we have contracted companies for the drilling we don't yet but uh, i have been there uh in North miami and i've met with drilling companies um and they're ready, willing, and able to drill. Uh, uh, they have capacity. They have the drills. So, you know, that's one of the great, great things about uh, about Niger is it has a long history of lots of doing lots of work um, in exploration and in mining. So, their drilling companies there, and uh, you know, they're anxious to support us. So, it won't be a problem. Great. Yeah. Uh, Orano announced in March a program to investigate in ISR method on the Imararan project. Uh, my question to you, if they are going to be successful, what do you think, what uh, does it mean for your property in terms of uh, valuation? You know, it should be very exciting. We, we have a technical committee member, uh, David Miller. He's one of the world's uh, in-situ recovery uh, experts used to work for uh, Arriva and um, uh, years ago. Uh, you know, he's very excited about this. So that, you know, the geology, as far as we understand at this point, continues from uh, Imararan North into our license. Uh, it may be that the flow of the aquifer continues into our license. Uh, that means if you're injecting CO2, et cetera, and you're, you're, you know, it's picking up the uranium and coming up, it, could that maybe that's going to be in our license? First of all, that yes. bodes well from uh, from our you know in terms of our relationship with Arano. But second, uh, you know, if the geology continues and the uranium continues, you know, it means our license uh, would probably be amenable to um, ISR. I mean, the economics of that are are extremely exciting if if it's if it works. Um, and uh, so you know, it's it's really good for us. Uh, I'll mention that Arano has been has been actually doing a lot of ISR work on this license for the past two years, yes. called it uh, hydro hydrological testing. So this is just a continuation of that an expansion. It's about $115 million Canadian investment that they just announced uh, right next door to us. So it's, uh, it's it bodes well, as we've said in our news release, we're, we're very excited about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you expand a little bit more on your other projects and uh, give me a fresh update on uh, them? Uh, I mean, Tagait sure. 2 and uh, Tagait 3. 
sure. Do you want me to talk about Afo Day too? Uh, and Afo Day. Sorry. Yeah. sorry. I mean the, yeah. the, the rest of the properties we didn't uh, discuss. Fine. So the you know Ashabut uh, that we just talked about sits between Arano, Zimmerer, and, and then uh, Goviex is Manuela, and then just north is is so, are the Somer and Comanac mines. Yes. Further further south on the same Arlet Fault, just south of Imararan, is our Afoday license. The fault that hosts Afoday, again, the Arlet Fault that comes down, intersects with the Azusa Fault inside of our license. Yeah. The Azusa, the Azusa Fault to the east goes up to Global Atomics DASA. So, uh, you know, uh, I think it's about 19 kilometers up the fault. At that intersection, Arriva did a lot of work. This intersection that is inside of our license, they did a fair amount of, of drilling, always only to 300 meters, always just directly vertical, not particularly caring about the faulting. This was Global Atomics' big innovation and uh, insight as they actually went into the faults to find the uranium traps yes, deeper. Yes, deeper uh, yeah. Where, you know, uh, Arano, Arriva didn't care about that. They were looking for these roll front sandstone uh, deposits. But they were, but at the end of Arriva's tenure on this license, the Asselier license, before they relinquished it, they did do some drilling uh, near the faults and uh, on either side of the Azusa fault. And they didn't really hit uh, what the, maybe what they were expecting. And they, there was sort of some understanding about what Global Atomic was up to, depending on the timing of how you, you know, the chronology, et cetera. And so they actually did something that you, you can't really do these days, uh, but that is really interesting. Uh, they shot seismic, yeah. just, you know, big explosions, and then measuring the response. <clears throat> they, they mapped out the subsurface, and what they what they saw, and we have this, people can look on our PowerPoint. What they realized is that uh, Arriva had drilled vertically just on either side of the Azusa Fault that hosts DASA up the yeah. road, but but they did not intersect the fault. So, you know, they did, they, and then they had to relinquish the license before they could come back and drill into the fault to, you know, emulate, copy uh, Global Atomic. Uh, too bad for them. Uh, very lucky for us. We are, uh, we have their seismic. Um, we have their historic, you know, drilling data. We, we see that their uranium values increase the deeper they get, increase the depth, but they all, because it was Arriva slash Arano, they stopped at 300 meters, no matter what. If they'd gone on deeper, who knows what they would have found. So we have their historic drilling, uranium increasing at depth. We have their geophysics, we have their mapping, and we have their seismic, these lines of seismic. And again, extremely interesting. Plus, so now we are also doing our drone mag that I just spoke about. We're doing that over that area, that intersection. And uh, that is happening starting maybe today. Uh, and then we, uh, this is where we will be doing this AMT method, uh, magneto uh, you know, can allow us to inter interpret the subsurface down yeah. very deep. Put all that together, get our drill targets. Hopefully we can identify potential mm -hmm. uranium traps and copy what Global Atomic did, which is find, you know, Athabasca like grades, uh, you know, 13% uranium over 0.7 meters. Yeah, that was uh, 46, unbelievable. Unbelievable. 46 yeah. meters, so 3%. Three, 3 uh, and they're just up the street from us. So that is our Afoday license. And we're, you know, extremely excited about it. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's more to say about Afoday, et cetera, but that's for the future. Further south, we have two very nice licenses, Tag A2, Tag A3. Less historic work, also owned by Arriva previously before they had to relinquish them. There, there is historic drilling. A uh, number of their their drill uh, holes encountered uh, uranium over 100 ppm. Again, these were shallow. These are on the same structures that host, sorry, the same structures that host Imararan and Somer and Komanak. The Arlet Fault goes through Tagay too, and uh, the Adrar Imolis Fault, which also hosts Global Atomics DASTA, goes through Tagay three. So. You know, these same faults that have that host big uranium deposits, they just go right through these licenses and they cross other faults that host other uranium deposits. Uh, there's the Azalik um, uh, uh, mine owned by the Chinese down to the west. That fault comes 
through the tag eight licenses. So these are, these are a little bit earlier stage. Yeah. You know, we're, we're an exciting company because we're, we're valued like a greenfield explorer, uh, but we're not. Yes. Yeah, so with those data, you are definitely not. We're to, we have potentially tens of millions of dollars worth of Ariva data that is gives us a roadmap. Um, and we have the insights from Global Atomic. Uh, you know, we've encountered to, historically, there's been lots of uh, uranium intersections over 100 ppm. Uh, about 20% of the historic drilling encountered that. Uh, so we are we're kind of a, we're a very exciting company that uh, not too many people know about, but they will. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's coming. Yeah, these tag eight, tag eight two and tag eight three, uh, you know, a bit more uh, early, earlier stage, but they're they're great candidates for work by us or joint venture. Um, you know, they're valuable, and we will advance them. Uh, that that was a part of my next question. Uh, would you consider to option some of those four properties? And if yes, which ones would you like to option, and which ones would you uh, keep uh, your focus on? Well, at the moment, because we're focused on these two areas, uh, Imerera North, that, that area of the intersection of the Arlet and the Matawella Faults uh, that we're, uh, that Arriva had drill plans for and that we have, um, we're doing geophysics on right now. Because we're already focused on that, we'll probably advance that ourselves. Yeah. And then also uh, where the Arlet and Azusa Faults intersect, again, Arlet that hosts Imerera and Azusa that hosts Dasa, yeah. that intersection we're doing geophysics. We'll, we'll probably focus on that ourselves. Everything else we would like to advance and we're open to joint ventures uh, on those because we just have so much acreage. We have so much land. We have over 1,800 square kilometers. We have approximately 1,822 square kilometers. You know, for comparison, there's a company called ENRG. It's an Australian company. It has, a, you know, a, a roughly $20 million market cap, uh, Canadian. It has about 750 square kilometers, uh, you know, a bit to our south and uh, east, I believe. And, uh, you know, we like our licenses uh, much better. Yes, they have some uh, historic uh, uh, resource, et cetera. Uh, but we're, you know, we're much more excited about our licenses and, and we've got more than double their acreage. Even 750 square kilometers is a lot for a small company to uh, to handle itself. So. We're open to joint ventures, uh, uh, companies that want to, uh, you know, talk to us. We're, we're open, and, and we, you know, we, uh, the market's getting hot. We're getting phone calls. Uh, there's, there, you know, there, things are happening. Um, you know, who knows if if we will do deals? But uh, we're open to them, and I'm, I think it's fairly likely that uh, we we will end up uh, working with other companies. So there is a there is an interest for that, and uh, I presume uh, companies are asking around that. Okay. Do you have do you have any negotiation going on? Yeah, I, I uh, at this point if, I can't. If you speak can to disclose that. it, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah, uh, but it would it would, but but interest in Niger is is increasing. People understand now. This is one of the places that. Uh, is open for business and uh, only a few companies have have the prime acreage. Um, Morano, obviously, already there. Uh, yeah. GoVX and Global have uh, great assets. Global has, has, has uh, all sorts of good things going on. And then us. I mean, we're, 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 one, of the, we're one of the big uh, license holders there. So uh, people are coming in. They have to talk to us if they want to. You know, we're, we're one of the, the groups they have to talk to. So, of uh, course, of course. Yeah, uh, Thomas, how would you describe your cooperation with the local community and the cooperation with your neighbors there, Global Atomic, Govix, and Orano? Are you in contact with them? I asked the same question uh, sure. to Daniel Major from Govix. Yeah, well, you know, I I know Daniel a bit. Uh, we talk, we chat. Um, uh, I don't know uh, Roman as well from uh, from Global, although I did sit on a. Uh, panel with him uh in toronto at pdac a uranium panel about about niger uh so you know we'll get to know uh global and and yeah. uh, and roman better over time yeah. um uh yeah what i do what i will say it's a small group of foreign Oof. investors there and yes. uh, we're, we're all there to help each other um you know we want niger to do well uh, that's going to help us all um i don't think 
uh, any of us views the other as competitors. Um, we have our areas. Uh, we're we're there to help each other, and uh, we we get along really well. As far as I can uh, say, I think we get along extremely well. Um, the French are also there to help us. They they want, uh, you know, they have a long, complicated history with with uh, with Niger and the government uh, because, you know, they were uh, the one company and big and colonial uh, association, et cetera. I think they're quite relieved and happy yeah. to have have us there. Uh, takes the pressure off them. We can do the exploration. I think better than than they could because we're explorers. They they were not, you know, it's big companies usually don't explore as well as, as uh, efficient Canadian and Australians. Um, so, you know, together it all kind of works, you know, I think it's, uh, it's good in terms of local community. Uh, yes. We, we have a, you know, it's maybe a Canadian type thing, but uh, we have a focus on community and social um, that almost comes naturally to us. So uh, it's extremely important. We employ local people whenever possible. Um, uh, we want to work with, everybody locally uh, support them. And as we grow, we're a small company at the moment, but as we grow, we'll have the resources to invest more and more locally. So far, so good. Yeah, so far, okay. so good. Uh, what about your project in Canada? Million project, right? Uh, what's, what's, yeah. the plan? what's the plan with this project? Uh, and can you give us a short update? Yeah, you know, gold is, uh, I would say, out of favor. Uh, in the markets right now. So um, uh, we're just letting it uh, sit there. It's in a really good location. It's an exciting little project, 50-50 um, joint venture with Probe. It's a Greenfield um, project. It is largely, yeah. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to wait a few months. We're probably around August or September. Let's talk again, and I can tell you what uh, what our plan is at that point. At the moment, uh, you know, okay. it's hard to get any value for okay. uh, for a small gold project, yeah. It's okay, I know, I know your focus is on Niger, but uh, I wanted yeah. to ask about this project also. Yeah, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a good pro, it's a good little project uh, in a great area. So, you know, we look forward to capturing some value from it. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, let's get to company finance. Uh, you recently closed yeah. the first trench of the private placement, where you raised just a little bit uh, over half million dollars. Uh, with that financing, how much money do you have in the bank right now, and uh, what do you, uh, when do you plan to raise uh, money for exploration activities, and potentially if you can expand on uh, the amount you plan to raise? So it's market dependent. Uh, we have, a, I would say, we probably have around one point three million dollars in the bank, give or take, right now. Yes. After the financing, and uh, you know, I think we'll probably raise a bit more money. Uh, in, in the near future at the same unit price that's 30 cents with a 35 cent half warrant um a lot of us management and then close people participated also uh really myself you know um uh, in that uh so what we're going to do is we're going to see how the markets are and uh and what our uh, plan you know drill plan is um once the geophysics is done and we've interpreted it then we can how many holes do we want to drill? How much is that going to cost? How much money do we need, et cetera, um, uh, to support all that? And then we will make that determination. Like I said, we could we could uh, get a lot of really good information for a million dollars. Uh, so a small drill program will give us a ton of insight and maybe even some real excitement. Um, and then we can dial it up from there, depending on, you know, uranium has been moving as you've yeah. seen the past week or two and uh and we are in a in a prime uh location with really good targets so uh let's see what our market cap is and um and uh and what kind of financing is available too yeah good okay uh you touched on company insiders how much skin in the game uh, are we talking here and how much do you hold personally i mean shares uh, of the company yeah, uh, I probably around, um, you know, including shares plus option, I probably have about 1.2. Uh, I actually can't quite remember because I just um, I probably bought another 100,000 shares at 30 cents, 30,000 dollars and 30 cents. So, you mean during the one, placement? Just the recent private placement. Yeah, uh, I keep, I invest, I invest every round and uh, will continue to. I, I bought some in the open market, but let's call it about 1.2 million shares 
out of the 28 million roughly um and plus i uh, have a lot of stock options uh, you know in line with normal uh, you know a junior public company uh, uh so maybe i have uh, uh 1.8 million uh you know approximately shares on a you know diluted basis um including options uh more relevant i suppose out of 28 and a half million shares out i would say about 11 million of those are held by our close group so um uh you know founders and uh, early investors uh, we have a we have an early investor named uh, uh brad newell who doesn't mind mind being mentioned uh, he was one of the first investors in great bear which sold for you know at a massive exit uh, a little while ago um, we have really good shareholders um, uh, who are smart and uh, right behind the company um, uh, so and together we own about 11 million out of uh, the 28 and a half million uh, I mentioned earlier our local partner Loxcroft mm -hmm. the vendor how much do they own eight, eight and a half million so you can see where that takes us uh, you know where where we are 19, 19 and a half million at that point out of 28 and a half and then a lot of the rest of the shares are owned by people that we've known for a long time. There are, you know, uh, friends, family, business associates, etc. So the um, uh, it's probably a few million shares owned by uh, outside investors. Uh, you know, three, four, five million that type of thing. That's uh, we would like to increase that. Yeah, but it's a a lot of the shares also are three year trickle out, uh, starting last August. So that further tightens. I mean, that's why it's. You know, small uh, purchases in the market move the and sales move the share price a lot uh, because it's we're just in that in between phase where people don't want to sell. Um, we've got uh, we want to see what's going to happen. Everybody's excited, and uh, you know, it's a it's a small uh, small small number of shares outstanding. Yeah. yeah, that that is sometimes uh, a great thing. Uh, uh, yeah. One of my questions. Add, I'll just add something. Yes. Uh, you know, I would like a lot more shares. Uh, personally, uh, I've paid real hard money for all my shares. Um, you know, the last, one of the bigger rounds was twenty cents. I put a hundred thousand dollars in at twenty cents. That was an earlier round. You know, significant money at twenty-five cents. Recently, thirty cent round. So we all paid you know real money for our shares. It's not like these, uh, and that's why there's such a small number of shares outstanding is all of us uh, have paid, you know, real and hard money for our shares. It's not, not like we've pulled out millions of shares at a cheap price. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's good to hear. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, you have recently appointed technical committee, including former chief operations uh, officer of Global Atomic. Uh, tell me more about the people behind Mirid Uranium and what every one of them brings to the company. Okay, good. Well, we have a, we have a big and very, um, uh, talented team for a junior. Uh, this is sort of an you know, unusual case. So there's myself. I told, gave you the introduction yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah. Our CFO, uh, our, our CFO is Nelson Lamb, not related, just nice. a coincidence with the last name. He worked at you know some of the big firms, Price Waterhouse, etc. Experienced CFO, uh, and with a great strategic uh, mind. So we're lucky to have him as our CFO. Uh, on the board uh, is Fred Bonner. He's a senior uh, Canadian geologist from the East Coast uh, uh, of Canada, uh, really a, a worldwide reputation in uh, you know, community, uh, social governance, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, extremely helpful on the, on the technical side, but also on governance and uh, social issues. Uh, so there's that. Um, uh, Loxcroft, our, our big shareholder uh, vendors, uh, able to appoint or entitled to appoint two directors and uh, there, these are extremely strong directors. Dai Kaba was number one. He was a former uh, senior mining partner at uh, uh, Faskins and uh, uh, other big Canadian law firms. Uh, he's a well-known international mining lawyer, now based in West Africa. That's Dai Kaba. He brings, you know, a, a, a lot of experience um, and uh, extremely strong director. Second director, uh, Loxcroft appointee, Cyril Amati, is a banker, um, West African and German, Germany-based, uh, big deals with uh, big groups, uh, Endeavor and others, um, and we're very lucky to have him on the board. 
um, Guy Pensent. He's a finance expert. Uh, also went to Cambridge. Uh, he's CEO of Less Mass Storage. Uh, it's a half billion dollar storage company in, in Central Europe. Um, and a longtime friend and colleague and uh, extremely smart guy. Uh, so we have a, uh, you know, a varied board that is, uh, uh, we come at this from a lot of different angles and uh, lots of experience and success. So that's the board, the technical committee. Um, we have David Miller, uh, who I mentioned earlier, used to work for Utah International, became Arriva. He's one of the world's top uh, in situ recovery experts. Um, and, uh, and also knows, you know, everybody in the business, et cetera, uh, long experience. Um, we have Adamu Uslane. He's, uh, one of the leaders in, in, uh, uranium, uh, geology and, uh, uh, government in uranium, uh, in, uh, Niger, local Nigerian. We have Michael Kante. He's a, a, a West African geologist. He's going to be leading a lot of our work on the ground in um uh in niger and uh uh you know and then there's uh ron hallis who you just mentioned ron was chief operating officer of global atomic and the, for the last three years he's been coo he recently left and his you know specialty was taking the, the company from you know discovery to mine construction and he did that this is sort of his sweet spot but you know of course he has tons of insight about the, how to work in Niger, the geology of, of global atomic uh, atomics assets, um, and the de asset deposit in particular, and uh, and everything else related to uh, what global atomic has done there in Niger. He's an incredible asset. We're extremely excited to have him uh, because we want to do what global atomic has done. A few years ago, they were our market cap, eight nine million, and look at them now, been yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars. We would like to do exactly that. Ron is hopefully going to help us uh, achieve that. Final member of our technical committee is uh, George Funderball. He's our he's our head geologist. Uh, he's a South African um, uh, uranium expert. Uh, he led the exploration of Peninsula's Karoo project that had thirteen thousand boreholes. Uh, you know he's an expert and he leads our uh, our uh, the technical side of our uh, of our work and. Um, that's our technical committee. So we've got a great group. Yeah, yeah, yeah I see. Uh, one important question for every investor who thinks long-term uh, for investment in uh, one company. Uh, where do you see Myriad Uranium in five years? And what is the goal here? Uh, is it to bring it to production or increase the, the value of the company by exploration? and bring the properties to a resource category and then sell it. What, what, what's the plan? Okay, I do not uh, develop and build mines, um, and our team does not do that either, particularly. Yeah. Um, I, what I would like to do is uh, make discoveries and do interesting transactions, joint ventures, sales of assets, etc. cetera. Okay. Uh, my job is to uh, create uh, wealth, for uh, our investors. So um, if that means an exit, if that means a liquidity event uh, where everybody makes a big gain, uh, we will do it. Um, uh, we can always bring on the bench strength to develop and build mines and et cetera, et cetera, if that's what has to happen in due course. Yeah. But we have, we are surrounded by successful companies that will want our assets if we make discoveries, Goviax is right there. The French are right there. Uh, yes. Global Atomic. Uh, the French have this have a big mill with lots of capacity. So if we make discoveries, I mean, think about think about Imerera, and we're a few kilometers north of Africa's largest uranium deposit that they're investing heavily in. Just to note, to the north of that, we just, we drill, we make uh, you know, we have some great interceptions. We we build out an exciting resource. Uh, you know, I can't speak for Hirano, but it, I, I think they would, I assume they'd have to take a hard look at us, right? Why, why, et cetera. Yeah. Just to the north is Goviax. So yes, I'd love an exit. Yeah. If, if we can sell for 50X, we're doing it. Uh, great answer, and I love the honesty here. So great answer, Thomas. Yeah, I mean, okay. I could, I could uh, yeah. 
No, that's no. That's our we, job is to uh, make our make, make our investors as much money as we can. Let's do that. Yes, I agree one hundred percent. Better to do something that you know how to do it than to do something that you don't know how to do it. Uh, before I that's let right. you go, uh, I have ten quick questions for all my guests in my show. They are called the B and B questions: bullish, neutral, or bearish. I send, I say one commodity okay. or stock, and you say, are you bullish, are you bearish, or neutral on that uh, commodity? All okay, right. are you ready? Uh, Let's oil. Do it. Uh, neutral. Oil neutral. Gas. Uh, gas. Neutral. Copper. Bullish. Gold. Bullish. Silver. Bearish. Lithium. Bullish. Uh, one that you know, uh, cobalt. I okay. am bullish. Okay. Hope, hopeful also. And bullish. Okay. How about the rare earth? I'm I'm bullish. Okay. Bitcoin. Neutral. And final one, S and P five hundred. Neutral. Okay. Uh, Thomas, how can investors reach out to you? So uh, easy on the website. Uh, send us an email. My, my email is up there. Uh, my email is at the bottom of our news releases, tlam at myriaduranium.com. Uh, uh, also, uh, my, our phone number is up on, uh, uh, on uh, in various places, uh, my phone number. And your, people are welcome to reach out to me. Um, WhatsApp is great. I, I like talking to investors. So. Yeah. It's great to hear. Uh, Thomas, thank you for this interview. I wish you all the luck with Myriad Projects and with your personal life, of course. Thanks, Lucho. It's been thank a pleasure. You. It's yeah. been a pl pleasure. It's all mine. Thank you very much.